Sonia and John McKinley both started out in New Zealand. Sonia studied languages at Victoria University while her husband attended the University of Wellington. They both moved together to Scotland where she received a doctorate in mathematical statistics and he received a doctorate in sociology, both from Aberdeen University. From 1971 to 1995, John held simultaneous professorships in medicine, biostatistics and epidemiology, and sociology at Boston University, and directed BU's Center for Health and Advanced Policy Studies and its Gerontology Institute. In 1986, the McKinleys founded their own private research company, the New England Research Institutes, specializing in health research. This classic article from 1977, shortly after they had settled in Boston, is important because it challenges the common idea that medicines and doctors have been the main causes of the revolutionary decline in death rates. The McKinleys present evidence that most major medical advances came after death rates had already declined and that most of the survival improvements were due to other causes. When you hear the word heresy, you normally think of an idea that violates some sacred religious doctrine. Galileo with his telescope was accused of heresy for saying that the earth was not the center of the universe and that it revolved around the sun. Joan of Arc was burned at the stake as a heretic for claiming that God spoke directly to her and told her to lead French armies against the English. But when the McKinleys used the term heresy, they referred to a completely secular idea, the idea that maybe the medical and pharmaceutical industries are not responsible for the low death rates and long lives that we enjoy in our technologically advanced societies. The near-religious doctrine that this suggestion threatens is simply the common assumption that high death rates and uncontrolled mortality have been brought under control mainly by doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and the industries that support them, and that claim an ever-increasing share of all the money and other resources in the modern world. Could this assumption that we owe our lives to medical science be wrong? Could the heresy suggested by the McKinleys turn out to be correct? If so, there must be some other possible ex explanations for falling death rates. This is why the McKinleys begin their article with a review of the various alternative explanations that might account for declines in mortality, particularly declines in contagious and parasitic diseases as causes of death. These declines are at the heart of the second stage of the demographic transition when death rates begin to fall from their previously high level, even while birth rates remain high and open up the era of rapid population growth that can occur in the middle of that demographic transition. This stage of early mortality decline almost always involves dramatic reductions in the risk of death from contagious and parasitic diseases carried by external agents like bacteria, viruses, insects, worms, and other pests. Many decades ago, Abdul Omran described these reductions as part of what he called the epidemiologic transition. Of course, the eventual death rate in all human societies never changes. It is always one to a customer. Everybody has to die from something. But over the course of the epidemiologic transition, deaths from these external causes decline and are replaced instead by what we sometimes call the civilized killers, like cancer, heart attacks, stroke, diabetes, and other causes of death. These civilized killers involve various parts of our own bodies betraying us and going bad in ways that eventually can kill us. The reason that death rates go down when these causes change is that the external causes of death kill most of their victims early in life, while the internal causes tend to kill people later. When most people in a population live more years of life, the share of them that die in any one particular year, of course, must go down. Omran explained this shift in mortality from external to internal causes by pointing out how much easier it is to control contagious and parasitic diseases like cholera or smallpox than it is to eliminate a cause of death such as heart attacks. But what are these means of control over external causes of death? over contagious and parasitic diseases. The mention of smallpox immediately suggests one popular explanation. 
In fact, this is the explanation involved in the near-religious doctrine already mentioned, that doctors and medicines were the key players in this shift. Edward Jenner noticed that milkmaids hardly ever got smallpox, and that when they did, the results were usually mild rather than life-threatening. He discovered that this was because they caught a milder form of infection, cowpox, from working with cows and milk. By deliberately giving people mild cases of cowpox with the vaccine he invented, he protected entire populations against the ravages of what had been a horrific killer disease, except, of course, for the skeptics who made fun of his vaccine and refused to have anything to do with it. But the McKinleys are not satisfied to stop with just this explanation. They know that data on the mortality decline in England show clearly that it was linked to John Snow's discovery that people were taking their water for drinking and cooking from pumps that drew that water directly out of the filthy, polluted Thames River in London. Disease pathogens were swimming happily in the water buckets that people carried back to their houses. Once this became clear, the era of great waterworks exploded on the scene. Country after country embarked on expensive, ambitious projects to build sewers to carry away contaminated water and water mains to bring in clean, disease-free water treated with chlorine and other germ-killing agents. We take all this for granted in modern cities. But until it happened, cities were pest holes of epidemics that drove the wealthy out to their summer houses in the country during the hot summer disease season and that killed off urban populations so fast that only a constant flow of replacements from the countryside could keep cities from shrinking away to nothing. Mortality decline also has been linked to the rise of modern nation states that united larger territories, improved transportation, and made it possible to move food supplies around to counteract the effects of local crop failures and to put an end to the threat of famines and death by starvation. Not only did better food supplies prevent starvation deaths, but better fed populations enjoyed much better resistance to contagious disease epidemics, lessening the mortality impact when such epidemics did break out. Finally, the McKinleys also discuss another less well-known and less well-understood possible reason for the decline of deaths from contagious diseases. When a pathogen that causes a disease survives over time in a human population, two complementary adaptive processes take place. On one hand, the people most susceptible to the disease tend to die off as its victims, leaving behind a surviving population with a larger and larger share of people who are resistant to that disease. This adaptive selection within the human population is matched by a separate process of adaptation in the population of bacteria or viruses that cause the disease. The most deadly examples of these pathogens quickly kill their victims, often before they can be spread to anybody else. This means that particular strain of the pathogen also will die off after it kills its host. It can only survive if it manages to infect another host before it kills the first one. The milder, less potent examples of the pathogen may persist in their human host for longer periods without killing them, allowing their hosts to pass the disease on to other victims. Thus, the pathogens adapt by becoming weaker and the people adapt by becoming stronger. This process of mutual adaptation has been going on between pathogens and our human population as long as people have existed. We will continue this inevitable dance into the future. So how much of the decline from high to low death rates witnessed during the second stage of the demographic transition should we attribute to medical measures in particular? How much of the decline must we leave to the credit of these other changes, including better sanitation and nutrition and the mutual adaptation of pathogens and their human hosts? In the next part of this lecture, we review the empirical results of their research into the mortality decline in the United States. To show the fall of death rates in the United States, mostly accomplished between the beginning and the middle of the 20th century, the McKinleys present a chart showing death rates separately for men and for women. The two curves fall in parallel at a roughly linear pace from 1900 to about 1950 or 1960, after which the time trend for both sexes is essentially flat 
once the transition to low death rates is accomplished. An important detail to notice about this chart appears in the title, specifying that these are age-adjusted crude death rates. A crude death rate simply divides all the deaths in a population by the total number of people in the population, usually expressed, as in this case, as deaths per 1,000 people. But the risk of dying varies tremendously at different ages. In human populations, death rates follow a J-shaped pattern. At birth, the risk of infant death can be quite high, but falls quickly to very low levels among children and young adults. Then as we move to older and older ages, death rates begin to rise again exponentially, curving upward at a faster and faster rate until the very oldest ages. This creates a serious problem for comparing populations over time when the share of people at different ages is changing. Even if the risk of death stays perfectly constant at every age, if we shift more and more people to older ages, as happened in the United States during most of the century, we would see a crude death rate that seemed to rise higher and higher because the people at these older ages have higher risks of dying. This apparent rise caused by an older population, even when rates are perfectly constant, is called an age structure bias. To get rid of any such possible biasing effects of an aging population, the McKinleys used rates of death at each individual age for each year to calculate age-adjusted crude death rates. These age-specific rates are combined with a single reference population, in this case the population by age as it was in 1900, to give crude death rates as they might have looked if the age-specific rates from each year had been removing people from the population by age as it was back in 1900. This is why the crude death rates shown in the figure look unusually low by later in the century. The crude death rates actually observed in the older 1970 population were higher due to the bias of an aging population. But if the population had stayed as young as it was in 1900, crude death rates would have dropped to about 2 per thousand for women and 3 per thousand for men, a small fraction of rates observed at the start of the century. Of this total drop in death rates, the McKinleys particularly want to know how much was due to fewer deaths from contagious diseases like tuberculosis, pneumonia, polio, influenza, and other pathogens. They consult data from death certificates that are recorded all over the country and then compiled into the annual reports of vital statistics of the United States, available from the National Center for Health Statistics. These vital statistics include not only sex and age of each person who died, but also information about causes of death. From this information, they know that nearly one-third of all deaths recorded in 1900 had external causes involving the contagious and parasitic diseases we want to study. What is more, nearly half, about 40%, of the total mortality decline over the next 70 years involved falling rates of death from these kinds of causes. So, if we can link the drop in deaths from these kinds of diseases to one or another of the explanations already reviewed, we'll be able to explain a good share of the total mortality decline experienced as the United States went through the second stage of its demographic transition. The authors then point out that a lot of important medical advances took place during the 20th century. Medical treatments such as the polio vaccine, the discovery of antibiotics like penicillin and other pharmaceutical advances gave us important new tools to fight various contagious pathogens. So far, we're building a pretty good chain of evidence that might actually support the near-religious doctrine that medical advances are what drove the country through that second stage of the demographic transition. But just when things are looking pretty good for the conventional wisdom about mortality decline, the McKinleys introduce their heretical question. How much of the improvement in mortality from various causes actually came after these miracle drugs and treatments were discovered and put into use in the population? After all, if a drug or vaccine causes death rates to fall, then the death rates should stay high until the discovery of the drug or vaccine, and then the rates should fall after we begin to use it. The article then presents a series of charts 
showing death rates for specific causes of death, such as measles, scarlet fever, tuberculosis, or typhoid fever. Each chart shows the trend in the age-adjusted death rate for a specific cause of death, and also marks with a small arrow the year when the medical treatment was discovered that is often presented as a cause of the decline. The heresy they talked about at the start of the article quickly jumps out at us. For all four of the causes of death just mentioned, virtually all of the fall in death rates happened well before the middle of the century. The discovery of a medical treatment against each cause, marked in time by arrows in the charts, only happened after almost all the decline in death rates was already finished. It is pretty hard to argue that one thing causes another when the cause only appears after the effect is already accomplished. Additional charts confirm this basic point. Drugs to treat pneumonia and vaccines against the flu came along after death rates from these diseases already had dropped dramatically. It is true that vaccines against the dreaded crippling disease of polio clearly did have a strong effect in lowering death rates from that former killer. But this is just one of just a few exceptions to the general pattern. And even in this case, death rates from polio also had been falling to some extent before the vaccine was discovered. The evidence from official death registration data for the United States seems plain and simple. Something else caused massive declines in death rates from nearly all previously deadly contagious diseases, and then medical advances came along later, made some last-minute token improvements, and since then have been given nearly all the credit for the decline in some accounts of that decline. That something else could have been improving sanitation in early 20th century cities. It could have been the incredible expansion of American agriculture and a resulting bountiful food supply transported and distributed across the whole continent. It could even have been gradual adaptation of our human population and the disease organisms themselves toward a less deadly symbiosis. But whatever it was, it is apparently incorrect to say that medical measures were the main cause of the decline. Since Sonia and John McKinley published this article in 1977, we have had a lot of time to reflect on their findings and to consider the implications of that work for population health as we find it today. In some respects, those implications might be quite disturbing for some attitudes that continue to be widely held right down to the present. As they show in their figure two, nearly all of the decline in U.S. death rates took place in the first half of the 20th century. The flat part of the mortality curve in that figure could be extended from about 1960 pretty much all the way out to the present in the 21st century. Although we continue to make some progress against death rates, that progress looks pretty tiny when compared to the huge declines that took place in the early 20th century. In contrast with this mostly static picture for death rates, that same 1960 time point marks a sudden explosion in the amount of money we spend on medical care in the United States. The line in the figure actually understates this trend because it shows the percentage of total gross national product that we spend on doctors, hospitals, drugs, and so on, and that GNP figure itself has been rising much faster than population. This means that medical costs are a rising share of a rising total of economic prosperity, a double whammy of increasing spending on all things medical. The contemporary furious debate about health insurance coverage in the United States is part and parcel of our preoccupation with medical care and is based on the same assumption that access to pharmacies, hospitals, and doctor's offices are the key to health and life itself. Without them, we are doomed. With them, all will be well. And certainly it is true that without certain medicines, some patients will die and that without certain expensive specialized tests and procedures, other patients will die. Critics of our current direction in health policy, however, often comment that specialized high-tech medical advances usually involve spending more and more money on fewer and fewer patients with rare and difficult conditions, while the general health status of the great majority of the population actually benefits very little from the latest new discoveries. 
Even the McKinleys themselves, back in the 1970s, could see that health care expenditures were increasing four times faster after mid-century than they had been in earlier decades. Since that time, while health spending per capita has been increasing at a pretty steady linear rate in most other advanced countries, like Australia, Japan, France, or the United Kingdom, that spending has exploded upward exponentially in the United States, in a manner completely unlike the trend in other countries. The height of the track for the United States shown in this plot of spending versus life expectancy shows how much faster our health expenses have increased compared to other countries. At the same time, the same plot shows that all the other countries have moved ahead steadily in improving life expectancy, that is to say, in continued progress against death rates, so that today people in all these other countries can expect to live far longer than Americans can. The United States has dropped farther and farther behind the leaders in life expectancy at the same time that it shoots farther and farther ahead of these other countries in the costs of health care. Something definitely is wrong with this picture. It may well be that the root of the problem is our focus on curing people once they become sick or disabled, rather than trying to prevent such problems in the first place. After all, as the old saying has it, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, particularly when it comes to the external causes of death that occupy center stage during phase two of the demographic transition. When death rates fall due to control of contagious and parasitic diseases, we see clear evidence in this article that most of the progress came before the discovery of modern medical treatments of these diseases. Most of the mortality decline in the U.S. demographic transition must be traced back to other factors, such as better sanitation, better nutrition, and perhaps also to the ongoing duel between pathogens and ourselves as we continually adapt to each other. Specifically, the two most important factors in falling U.S. death rates were control of tuberculosis and control of pneumonia, both bacterial diseases that used to kill large numbers of people. Nearly all of the declines in death rates from these two major contagious killers took place before we had reliable medical treatments for them. More generally, the McKinleys summarized their research by concluding that of the total decline in death rates over the 20th century, at most 3.5% could be ascribed to medical measures introduced to control contagious diseases. The other 96.5% of the total mortality decline during our second phase of the demographic transition came from somewhere else. It probably would be wise to reflect on this tiny role played by medical treatment in the U.S. demographic transition when we find ourselves caught up in the sometimes very heated debates about boutique doctors, health insurance, the cost of drugs, and other features of the medical industry that would like us to believe that our very lives depend upon the transfer of an ever larger part of the country's economic resources into their hands.